there's a team and it has a boss. The boss gives orientation and identity. She brings in most of the clients. She spends her weekends in pajamas thinking up crazy new projects. She has the network to get these done. Now take that boss away, and what you first get is a fragmentation. With a single anchor gone, team members withdraw into themselves. Pressures and anxieties kick in. Will they be able to bring in enough clients to pay their salaries? Who's going to come up with the next big idea which will electrify the whole team? Can they rely on their co-workers to deliver the high quality of work needed? Who's going to solve a hidden conflict? Yes, once my business card stated that I was la boss of our organization. Now it says I'm the godmother. This change from an organization with a leader to a network organization where the team is in charge has been one of the most intense and rewarding experiments we've done in our company so far. We hear a lot about digital disruption and digital transformation today here as well. And of course, you know, we see many instances where our economies get uberized. But I believe that we are yet to really understand an accompanying, possibly much more fundamental change. And that is the way we're going to work. All the trends which we see in digitization, the shifts from hierarchies to networks, from centralization to decentralization, from fixed static entities to agile organisms in constant flow, all of these are going to change the way we are going to lead our companies and get its work done. You probably have heard some of the buzzwords of the new operating systems on the horizon, holacracy, teal organizations, or simply new work. And we know quite a bit about the organizational, the structural changes involved in such a transformation. But I believe we very rarely address an even fundamental, more fundamental change. And this is a change that comes from within. These new operating models require us to do some inner work. And this inner work is at the core, is the backbone, is at the heart of the new leadership paradigms. And like all inner work, it's exciting, but it's not easy. Six years ago, I founded an organization in Berlin here, a nonprofit think tank called the Better Place Lab. A year and a half ago, I decided it was time for me to move on. But leadership successions in social businesses such as ours are tricky. They are very often heavily dependent on the founders. You know, we used to have a joke in our company. Sometimes when we uh, dis uh, in discovered a budget deficit, one of my colleagues would say, Johanna, can't you just go and have lunch with somebody and bring back a contract? Well, unfortunately, it wasn't so much of a joke because the personal connections were the basis of a lot of our paid work. So what were we to do? You know these situations when you're looking for new answers and you have no idea where they might be coming from? Well, my answer came from Dennis, my colleague, over lunch. He told me about a book he had been reading, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Laloux. In this book, the author describes case studies of companies who operate without a boss and very few managers. They are self-organized, and they practice a flexible, competency-based hierarchy. When I read that book, I was really electrified. And the team also immediately jumped to the challenge to transform itself what Lalou calls a teal organization. Today, we operate without a boss. In principle, everybody can make any decision. This time of the year, we are going through our peer-to-peer -peer salary negotiations and the collaborative budgeting process for the next year. We have a pipeline full of projects, and, you know, it seems to be really great. Well, yes, it is great, but there's a lot of work involved, and what I want to do here is I want to share with you some of the learnings and, you know, what worked and also what didn't work so well. 
First of all, you know, we really did devise and design new structures and new organizing principles in our company. We did this together with a great coach, Bettina, and we came up with a few, you know, new paradigms. For example, we said we wanted to give full freedom to project managers to really run the projects the way they want them to be run, in order really to unleash their full creative potential. We also realized quickly that it wasn't enough that we strengthened individual autonomy and individual excellence. People also needed to be able to have the whole team on the screen. I mean, they wanted to steer the whole organization. So for that, we came up with some new roles. We call them Überblicker, overlookers in English. And these overlookers for key areas such as strategy, finance, or team spirit, it's their responsibility that these topics are on everybody's radar. And we also invested a lot in creating a really open, transparent feedback culture as the backbone of the way we wanted to work in the future. And, you know, it really did work. If you want to find out more about how we operate in detail, you can go online and check our new Verfassung, our constitution, which we've just published this week, and where it's described in all detail, you know, the way we make decisions and we collectively steer our organization. But as I said before, you know, there's something more fundamentally involved in this transformation from being an employee to being a new worker. And that's this inner work I've been talking about. You know, we all needed to do some inner work in order to really be able to fulfill this transformation. And it's about this inner work that I want to devote the rest of my talk to. Let's do some basic developmental psychology. And what I'm going to tell you now, I learned from the spiritual teacher, Thomas Hübel. Every healthy belonging of a child as well as of a 30-year-old think tank worker depends on a healthy balance between two poles, belonging and becoming. Only if we have a safe belonging can we be creative, can we go out into the world, take risks and innovate the future. Now, during the Team Transformer process, it became apparent that I had been good at this, you know, becoming part. I had given lots of freedom and inspiration for people to be innovative but I had not been so very good at creating a good becoming, a belonging. So the ties between team members, the trust between them was not so strong. So, you know, it became obvious that we needed to work on this, on the belonging part, first of all. And our coach focused on three capacities and worked with us on the, these over the last year and a half. The first one is, to be grounded and know yourself. You know, the function of a hierarchy and a boss in the outside world is that they give stability. Now, if you remove that stability, for example, by taking away the boss, people have to create the same kind of stability within themselves. You know, the outside hierarchy is a crutch you lean on, so now you have to do it by yourself. And you really have to establish a good self-contact. You have to know yourself well in order to live through crisis, you know, make forceful decisions and do all of the other things which, you know, you need to do when you want to lead. Now, you might think that this is trivial, you know, that, you know, we all know ourselves. But it turns out not to be so trivial. Maybe you just want to check it yourself. In this very minute, do you really know what's happening in your body? Do you know where it's contracted? where energy is flowing freely. Do you know what's happening with your emotions? Are you agitated, bored, joyous? And what's happening really in our mind? You know, we all have these monkey minds where there are so many thoughts going on. Do we really know what we think? And so for us, it was a really important exercise to very often just check in and really get to know each other better. Good self-contact also was so important because it was the basis of the second capacity we worked on. And that is to be able to really connect and empathize with our colleagues. I know you or I feel you through me. And if I don't feel myself, I can't feel you. Now, fortunately, there are things we can do in order to increase our capacity to see each other and feel each other beyond the mere cognitive level, the words we exchange. 
we can learn to be, have more subtle awareness of where our counterparts are, what that is going through them emotionally, for example, right now. Most of us are able to develop this empathy. But that's yet another thing to develop our the third capacity we worked on, which is much harder. That's multi-perspectivity. You know, it's one thing to know where they are, to, to feel into the other, but it's something quite different to really be able to change perspectives and really see the world through somebody else's eyes. I might, for example, know what a harsh criticism would do to me, how I would react to it. But that's something very different from knowing how it will land in you, what it will do in your inner world. And you know, this was something we also worked on as part of our Team Transformer. That was the name we gave to our collective journey. Now, you know, if people are really, I mean, this work really paid off. People are now able to show up much more wholly as before. They are able to show up with their strengths as well as with their shortcomings. We have established a very open feedback culture. And also, conflicts don't get swept under the carpet, but they are put out on the table. Interestingly enough, one of the things where I, for me, you know, where I thought this really works was when a few people decided to leave us. Because they felt that their individual needs and their capacities were not really fully aligned with what the new lab was needing and was looking in them. And the process has been respectful and constructive. So I would say we have managed to create a good belonging. But you know, I mean, that's you know, really the purpose of a lab such as ours is to be innovative and to become. So how did we increase our capacity for innovation? First of all, we really gave people radical freedom. Or we gave, I can't say, you know, I gave, we gave each other radical freedom. We said, you can work on every project you want to. You know, you can work from where and when you want to. So we've had times when there were eight team members in eight different countries doing research, and we only met once a week for our team meeting on Skype. If you look at the innovation literature, you will find out that a lot of innovation happens when you remix and recombine existing ideas and things. So in order you know, to strengthen this kind of innovation muscle, we encouraged each other in the team to get as much input as possible, to read a lot, you know, books and blogs, and listen to podcasts in our subject area, but also to dive into other industries or disciplines. So we collaborated with an art gallery. We dived into philosophy or xenobiology. Apart from this inspirational input, there is yet another source for inspiration. And that is an innovation which comes from within. Every one of us has their own unique mix of structure and open space. Structure, my structure are my thoughts, my habits, my conventions, many things which come from the past. Open space, on the other hand, refers to my intuitive capacity to meet life moment for moment in a fresh and new way. You know, it's this space, this open space, where new ideas suddenly appear, seemingly out of nowhere, like aha effects or flashes of genius. And there are techniques where you can strengthen this source of for innovation. They are called mindfulness, meditation, or having walking meetings. And we did all of those in our Team Transformer. So far, new work has worked for us. But as is with every new development, there are also downsides to it. And I would just want to name two. First of all, it is expensive. You know, all this, the whole team devising new structures and new roles, all the inner work you needed, we needed to do took up time and cost money. So in the future, we will have to be much more efficient to do these, this work. Also, I would say it's not for everyone. There are people who just do need more stability and safety at work. And for them, I don't think that this organizing principle really is the best way to work. 
Also, there are people who find it really hard to have the right balance between, on the one hand, individual autonomy and excellence, and on the other, to really have the whole organization on their screen. That is pretty difficult. And a third type of employee, I would say, is very consensus-oriented and finds it hard to come to terms with the very open, also at times very critical feedback necessary in order for an organization to reach its excellence. And for me, that is a really important distinction. You know, new work is not some egalitarian, hippie style of doing work. There are hierarchies, but they are fluid and competency-based, and that's a big difference. Despite these challenges, for me, new work is the next big thing in management. Its DNA is really well aligned with the technological forces of the digital age. It empowers people to grow. And this growth is not limited to the workspace. Working from within leads to living from within. It enables us to come in touch with our core intelligences, to be more clearer, more mature, more innovative and more caring human beings. And all of these qualities are really important for us to embrace and work on the many challenges we have in our world. New work is an update for our humanity. Thank you.